I think college and being a student athlete in college is such a formidable time in a young person's life. I just get to see it every day. Hey, welcome to Beyond the Game. I am Mike Lacey, and I am so excited to have one of my best friends from football, Mr. Tom Homo, here with us today talking about Beyond the Game, the stories behind sports. Tom, well, welcome. Welcome back to the BYU and where it all started for you and me. It was a long time ago, over 40 years ago. Well, don't you don't have to bring that up, Tom. Come on. And we're back. There were this where this building is used to be the field. Yes. And so when they built the student athlete building, it's right on top of where we practice. Where we used to warm up. Yeah, it's right. So my office looks out towards the field, and I have a lot of days where I just stare out onto the field with no one there, and I can mem I can remember ex incredible detail of things that happened in those days, practices that occurred on that field. I have a, this is this is just off the cuff here, but do you remember your coach Dick Felt? Sure. Right? What did he do in between practices out on our practice field? Well, I know he walked all the time. He walked on that field all the time. And even after he retired from football, he had had a heart attack. And so he needed to walk. And I would see him when I was work, when I came back to work here, um, as a, in, in, um, development, I'd look out my window and see him walking in the rain and the snow really? and he walked uh, for a long, long time to try but didn't to he have a out. golf club in his head. Oh, he, he always had a golf club and <laughs> this was, this actually served as a doubled as the football practice field and the golf driving range. You didn't ever sprain an ankle on one of those balls. Did you? It's funny that, you know, we would go out and you could probably find three or four balls a day that were stuck in the tall grass that we would find. And we had some tall grass on that practice field. I remember just how, you know, it was it was 40 years ago, and yet it seems like yesterday. Yeah, it sure does. I mean, we were young back in the good old days, and when you have good memories of your teammates and of games and cultures of teams, that lasts forever. I try to tell the BYU athletes right now, I often talk to the men's and women's teams, each sport, one of the key things I like to say is, hey, look at guys, you don't know what I know. I have over 40 years of experience in life since I've been here. But if you give everything you have and you give more than you take from your teammates to your team, these relationships will last forever. If you take more than you give when this game's over, when the season's over, when you graduate, you're going to be on your own and you won't be around the team. But I'm living proof and have hundreds of friends that I was teammates with that when you give more than you take, it lasts forever. And that's a cool thing. And they look at me like, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Tom, I'm curious, what brought you to BYU? Well, I was I was grew up in L.A., L.A. suburb of L.A., Crescenta Valley High School in La Crescenta, California, to be specific. And I, I was getting recruited by a number of schools, and I was a quarterback, and I shattered my finger on my uh, throwing hand. Oh. I had to have surgery in my last game of my senior year. So BYU had recruited me, and they were looking at me as an athlete, and you know, I played quarterback and played defensive back. And a lot of teams dropped me right then because during recruiting season, I had this surgery, I had a big ball on my hand, and I was a quarterback. <laughs> And so you can't B even hand it off. Yeah, sure. Ball. BYU was, uh, they said, you know, Tom, we, I was an all CIF defensive back at the time in Southern Cal. So they said, you know, you probably could have made a quarterback, but we got a couple of guys. We got a guy named Mark Wilson, a guy named Jim McMahon. I think we're pretty set. So we'll move you to defense. And that's the football part. But I came up here on my visit in January and it snowed 
while I was on my visit. I'm from LA. I'm a Southern California beach boy. I wasn't sure I was going to take that, but I think it was the spirit that was on the campus. I wasn't a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the time, but I just felt there was something to the organization, the team, as I would say it. Had a great time and met some of the players. On my visit, I came up with two players from Glendale that were at Glendale College. Who were they? Um, Randy Tidwell and Andy Reid. No way. <laughs> so, so those two, obviously Andy, the head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, we came on a visit together. I was, fr- I would have, my high school would have fed into their junior college. So they came up as juniors and I came up as a freshman. And um, just the, the trip, the people, the coaches, of course, the great Lavelle Edwards, you mentioned Dick Felt, Fred Whittingham was a great one, Scoville and on and on. I, I, I'd stop right there, but every one of the coaches was super special. Let me stop you right there for a minute, Tom, because I want to go into some of these things that you've kind of led into. But Tom Homo has a history. I looked at his bio, and I mean, most of us would, would just die to have done some of the things that you've done. I mean, consider. I mean, what was your last year at BYU? 1982. 1982. Did you play against Georgia? Yes, we did. Okay, I'll ask a question about that, too. Uh, no, you, you scored a touchdown, an interception. Yeah. Pick six. Right. Okay, let, time out, Mike. Tom Homo played on some of the best teams BYU ever had. I think you'd probably agree that you had some of the best coaching across the board here. I look at that now and say, wow. How did Coach Edwards do that? Well, I think that was the the secret sauce of Lavelle. Lavelle was a man of character. Um, he had incredible integrity. He had a great sense of humor. <laughs> he loved the players, and the players loved him. I think it was a he was a little bit before his time, where he really cared about the connections and the relationships. But he put together an incredible staff that had in great football acumen and that was it he let them have autonomy to coach the team the specific philosophies and strategies and techniques and all those things that were on the field Lavelle put it all together it all fell under the umbrella of the great Lavelle Edwards but he spent more of his time on the relationships with the players making sure that they were um, in every way emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically ready to play and to go to BYU. He loved football. He's in the Hall of College Hall of Fame <laughs> as a coach, but he knew that there was more to going to college than just football. There had to be a balance. And we all had a balance. We were, at that time, we were sending out missionaries in droves and he never complained once about the disadvantage that it could you know, play. And it was. And it, it was very difficult, but he turned what seemingly could be a disadvantage into an incredible advantage because I would say from my experience, the vast majority of the players that came back were better. They were more mature, obviously. Um, physically, they might not have been as strong, but that came but they were a little bit more, maybe a little bigger. But most importantly, they, in their minds and in their hearts, I think most of those missionaries that returned knew what they wanted at that time, and they were willing to give. And they had just serviced and sacrificed two years of their life for other people all around the world. And so now to come back, it was easy to service and to sacrifice for the good of the team. But it's interesting, Tom. I'll... I'll uh go here just real quick because in 1975 that was my freshman year and I was behind two seniors at weak side linebacker and it looked like my my position was going to be starting weak side linebacker in 76 but then my bishop came here from Sacramento and called me on a mission oh, wow. and it was it it wasn't a problem for our coaching staff but it was a question mark because I, re- I remember one of our coaches saying, Mike, these guys go away and they preach love and all this stuff and they come back and they usually don't play football. 
And something in my heart right then said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to play. And it took some time, but it happened. And it wasn't just me. There were tens of guys and now hundreds and thousands over the years that have come back and proven that it's a good thing. Well, I, I would think your era, you know, somewhere, I don't know if you're at the beginning, but... Well, Lance Reynolds was the only guy who had come back and... Okay, so... Well, Phil Jensen. That was about the start of that era. And I think that's an important era of, of BYU football and BYU athletics because it is one of the trademarks of BYU and BYU athletics... And, and BYU the complaints from opposing coaches. Oh, yeah. Right? And BYU football, though, is that we send players on missions. And it's interesting that the tradition continued and got stronger and stronger after you had left. Oh, yeah. And it continues to this day. But there was a change that when the, the age of missionaries changed from 19 to 18 for men and from 21 to 19 for women— that caused a little bit of a change in the process. And how you were recruiting. And exactly. So it was something that the um, prophet and the brethren decided that this was a change in the policy and BYU adapted in stride. So it was, it was a time where when our coaches on the women's side, we didn't have women, most of the women that went on missions would finish up their eligibility be about 21 years old and, and then go. go. Right. But when it changed to 19, all of a sudden you had young women who were all of a sudden thinking, I want to serve a mission. The spirit touched them. They didn't, there's, we don't have a lot of young women that come saying, I'm going to go on a mission in their recruiting. But what, when they get to BYU, they it's the same decision. spirit that everybody else feels <laughs> and they go. But I think this is really cool. In the last two, it, we've been to the College Cup in women's soccer two out of the last three years. And the first time, we had six players on that College Cup team that went on missions immediately after the game. One was serving her um, home MTC <laughs> from, from the hotel. <laughs> and that's... Who was her companion? That was, <laughs> yeah. She had a companion for sure. But... This the the point is, BYU is different. We don't we're similar to many schools in many regards, but we are different in some regards, and that's who we are. And if you come and some coaches have tried to change that, some right. you know administrators have said we got to change this, and it's not a secret sauce. It's just the right it's way. It's part of the it's, recipe. It's part of our fiber. It's the fabric of what we are, and if. If you come here and as a coach or a player, as an AD, as a student, if you're aligned with the university and the church and the gospel, you're going to be just fine. If you're out of alignment, it's a hard place to be. It can be, can't it? I'm impressed, though, Tom, that you know when I came into the school in the late 70s, early 80s, when we were on our team together, the teams, um. I, I think it was like 60% of us were members of the church and maybe 40% weren't. How was it coming here as as not a member of the church? Yeah, I was from, I, I was a, a member of another faith. Right. And so I was a strong Christian and I had faith. I was strong. A lot of people told me, you can't go to BYU. Yeah, be you can't too. do that. You're going to have trouble. Um, I, I, my family really didn't want me to come to BYU. My friends didn't. My coach didn't. Neither did mine. Didn't. I'm from California, too. Yeah, so I, I think one of the cool things that I, I really love to look back on is I had other opportunities and other scholarships, but I chose BYU, even not being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I did that because I felt I wanted to do it. I knew what the Spirit was, but I didn't know at the time that the Spirit was saying, this is going to come here because it's going to change your life forever. You're going to join the Church and and things will change the, you and your posterity forever. That's not what I was thinking. But I, when I was here on my trip and in my first year, I felt like this was the place. That's so. so Brigham Young came across these mountains <laughs> he said and the said, same this thing. is the place. And I think I said the same thing. Wow. And I think cha things have changed. And I think it's one of the benefits or blessings that I have as the AD now 
is that I had an experience at BYU where I wasn't a member of the church. And so for so many of the athletes, and there's still a fair number of uh, student athletes and coaches that are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but th- we need them. We love them. I'm so grateful oh, we so had a diverse team. Yeah, so I'm going to go back, and about three years ago, I, I talked to the football team at the beginning of every year, and, I, you know, it's just a welcome, Cougs. Hey, I'm the AD, but I'm here speaking as an alum. I get that rare opportunity that y'all wish you could <laughs> as teammates is to come speak to the right. team. And I get that beautiful opportunity once a year. I could do it every day, but I, I don't do it very much. And a couple of years ago, I was thinking, you know, this is a pretty diverse <clears throat> team. So I went back and I looked at the 1978, my freshman year. I looked at the roster and I, my numbers might be a little off right now, but there, I, one of the things that was unusual for me coming from California is at my high school, there was one Polynesian student at a three-year high school that I went to. Really? And he was a friend of mine. Chemo artist was his name. I can still remember. Just My friend art. was Sam, Samuelo Ukulele Sumalo. Oh, there you go. And you had one? Okay. Yeah, and we had one. Okay. He was the fullback so, and I was so the halfback. When I came to BYU and the, we come out to practice, oh, yeah. and I thought, there's a lot of Polynesians. We had, I want to say, seven. At least. Not, that, that's not a lot. I No. Okay. And then, uh, oh, no, excuse me, I want to say five uh, Polynesian uh, football players, and I want to say seven black players. Okay. You'd think it might have been the other way around. Yeah. But back in those days, that's not a lot, you know? No, not so at it, not So in this year, one of the things I wanted to point out to them is on this team, it was two, three years ago, there were more minority players, Polynesian or uh, black or, you know, Hispanic, than not. Really? More than half. Wow. And a lot of those were members of the church, and quite a few weren't. But the beauty was, through the years, this the school has changed, and the diversity has strengthened our school, and it's strengthened our teams. Danny Frazier was my my roommate. There's a there's one of the key historical features of BYU football that the story goes untold is Danny Frazier is one of the most important players, I think, in the history of BYU football for what he brought to the team in every respect. And Mike, I still see him and talk to him regularly because of what I said before, of what that bond of love that we established in 1978 for me, earlier for you, that we were going to be in South Oh, and it was amazing. Yeah. We had some... And that's why I want to do this podcast, because there are so many fun, interesting, good stories. Danny Frazier's one of them that you can share. And as AD, you're in the middle of it. I I interrupted myself because, of course, Tom Homo, famous BYU athlete, now athletic director. So I, I say that is two different eras of your life. And then you had this fancy uh, experience playing for the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. I mean, tell me about that. What's that like? Well, I tell you what. I, I grew up loving the sport of football. I loved all sports. Was Were the 49ers your team? No, I grew up in L.A., so I and was a Rams Ram fan. And the Rams were my team, too. I was a Ram fan. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think every young boy dreams of playing in the NFL, if you like football or if you like basketball, it's the NBA, Major League Baseball, whatever it may be. But... You know, I was I was like a, a skinny little kid. I was tall and thin. I was fast. But I really didn't ever think that I could play in the NFL. I mean, I looked and watched the games, and I just thought it was a, it was kind of a goal probably beyond my reach. But as I grew and I got faster and faster, and, and I loved the sport, I had great support from coaches and my family, an older brother who was nine years older than me that played football at UCLA, and so I could, he was my mentor and I followed everything he did. I, you know, I, I started thinking I can get a scholarship because my brother got a scholarship. I wanted to get a scholarship. My brother hurt. He got hurt. He hurt his neck. At UCLA. Had a vertebra, broke, fractured a vertebra. He was okay. But um, he, that was his last game. And, and he was out. And so his dream of being in the NFL didn't come to fruition. But 
he continued to push me and said, like, you are going to go to a school, you're going to get a great education. So my goals and dreams were to play college football, get a great education, and go on from there and start my career. I saw you got a, a degree in zoology. Were you going to be a doctor? Yeah, I was a pre-med student here at BYU. Wow, cool. Zoology, my kids said, well, were you going to be a zookeeper, or what were you going to do? <laughs> but it was at those times, there was a big range science department here, so it wasn't. It's now biology. So in what, about my third or fourth year here, at, my fourth year here at BYU, I played five, um, Dick Felt, my DB coach, one day I came in to film a little early, like I like to, and we'd look at film. He said, you know, if you if you have a halfway decent year this year, or a good year, you're going to get drafted. And I'm like, what? I'm going to get drafted? And he said, yeah, you're good enough to play in the Isn't NFL. That great? And that was the first time. It was my fourth year. How did that feel? Well, I, I just knew that Dick felt he'd played in the NFL. Right. And so he would have known, and he he taught me a lot of the tricks. Did that just the, give you some kind of level of, of confidence? Um, not really. It was just like shock and surprise. But he had I know he had trained me. He he taught me the tricks and trade, tricks of the trade, a lot of secrets as an NFL D V. <laughs> and I was blessed that he taught me that. Fred Whittingham was a NFL linebacker. Fred, Fred played in the NFL too. Yeah, he did. And he taught me a lot of things about strategy and and different things and about competing. And so like I had this incredible combination of coaches that prepared me to be in the NFL. I don't know if I would have made it if I was at another school. That might sound silly, but I think me coming to BYU prepared me to go into the NFL. Wow. It did, I'm sure. And so many of your our teammates went on and played. Yeah, there was a lot of them. Oh. It was fun to be in the NFL at that time because there were there so were, many alumni. There weren't very many games I'd play in where I, uh, someone on the other team wasn't on, uh, and, an and alum. And the 49ers. I mean, how many BYU alums played? Yeah, we had a lot. I mean, when I got there, Billy Ring was yeah. a running back, and uh, we we're still super close. The two, uh, two years after I got there, uh, Todd Shell came when it was a first-round draft pick. Wow. And then there were a number. Obviously, Steve Young came later and many others. How fun. All right, let's step back to Georgia. Because I remember, all right, I blew out my knee my senior year, so all of a sudden they had to become a fan. And it was way harder to be a fan than a player, in oh, my yeah. opinion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Sitting up in the stands and depending on you guys to win the game was harder if I wasn't out there helping. But I remember that Georgia game. They were ranked very high. You guys traveled out to Athens, and this upstart BYU team that's been making a little bit of noise, right? Tell me tell me about that game. I remember particularly uh, two plays, one that you were integral in, and then another one where there was a fumble. Well, I think looking back at the game, the first thing you have to think of is Herschel Walker. They had a player named Herschel Walker <laughs> who was phenomenal, and it was a, it was a, a low-scoring game. It was 14-7. Um, BYU going into the fourth quarter and into the fourth quarter. And um, I had intercepted a, a pick, six pick six earlier in the game, but Steve Young had thrown a pick six, <laughs> so it was 14-7. And, and they scored late to tie it up, and then we had the ball with the clock running, but we had to give it up. And then they got into a position – where it, I'm, I'm not going to go into the fourth down play. But, now, come on. But I would just say. I remember late, that play. Late in the game, uh, they had a great NFL kicker, Kevin Butler, that played with the Bears for many years. I think it was 52-yard. He kicked a 52-yard field, field goal wow. as time was expiring to beat us 17-14. Wow. You guys played so well. I was proud yeah. of. of I, I think there was an important. Uh, piece of information from that game that I'd like to share. And that was our quarterback that day was Steve Young. And he threw six interceptions in that game. And one of them was a pick six. And I think that it's something that I've remembered for a long time is Steve was frustrated and a little depressed about it, but he bounced back and became a first team all American that year. He was a great quarterback, but the part I want to talk about is for they Lavelle didn't give up on him. He believed in Steve and he saw something in Steve, and so did you know, Ted Tolner and the coaches that were there at the time, where 
what would have happened to Steve if they would have put him on the bench or sat him down and he didn't get another chance? But they, they gave him another chance, and the rest is history. The rest is history. Can I share a little bit on that, Absolutely. too? Absolutely. All right. I'm a return missionary. I was on that famous red shirt team of 1978. All of us are so excited about the future because, you know, our whole red shirt team, the guys who weren't playing, but we were working out every day and getting ready every day for the next year. Um, we knew that we had a powerful group of guys coming in to help out the team the following year. So Doug Scoville was the head coach at the time. And Doug, I remember, didn't necessarily like a left-handed <laughs> quarterback. And Steve was so athletic that he could break out of the pocket at any moment, which wasn't what Doug Scoville wanted from his quarterback. So Steve, as, as he's written in his book, and as I know personally because he came up to me, he was our sixth-string quarterback. Yeah. And I forget if this was 78, 79, it was probably 79, because I had made the move from defense to offense, and I had come back from a mission, and I was able to play. And so Coach Edwards asked Steve to talk to me about, one, maybe what are the issues about going on a mission? Can you come back and play? And two, what about switching from one side to another? Because he was so fast, yeah. he could have been a defensive back too. And the rest is history, Tom, yeah. because coaches changed. Ted Tolner saw something different. Steve Young obviously became one of the best quarterbacks ever, despite this this Georgia game. Yeah, and I, I, as I said, that I think BYU prepared me for the NFL better than maybe any other place. The same was true for Steve. I mean, Steve came here. And he, he was an option quarterback in high school. He didn't throw the ball. It might have been Veer. He might have thrown it a little bit, but he was a running quarterback. And he was the last the last scholarship that Lavelle gave that year. Really? The last one. And so when he came, everybody saw that he was a phenomenal athlete. But he had to be paired with Scoville and Tolner and Holmgren. That's a lot of different. You know, those, those I were, mean, those are some great names. Those were guys that that made a difference. And if you could be a quarterback under any of their tutelage, you just won the lottery. So coming to BYU was the right place for Steve. And when I talk to Steve, he also mentions just being, you know, right next to Jim McMahon. Yeah, and working his way up. Right. You know, and the 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 cool thing about Steve is Steve is a humble guy. You know, to this day, he's, he's way out front as far as, like, a member of the church, and he's in the NFL Hall of Fame. I love this new Hall book of Fame. Is. Everything. Wonderful. But I think that one of the attributes that has brought him so far is he's humble. And, like, for him to play behind Jim McMahon for two years, it gave—he was watched. He watched Jim. And Jim was a great teammate. You know, we all love Jim. Jim was a great teammate, and when he left, Steve had learned a lot. The next part is Steve goes to the USFL, LA Express, oh, then man. he gets picked up by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we, the 49ers, played Tampa Bay and Tampa one year, and Steve DeBerg was their quarterback, and Steve DeBerg had a horrible game, and we crushed him, and Steve never got in the game, and DeBerg had thrown like five interceptions. And so after the game, Steve comes to me, after the locker room, we're, you know, after this is long after the game, the and hallways. he is crying and saying, I got to get out of here. I can't take this anymore. I, I'm just losing my confidence. I'm losing my ability to play. Can you get me to San Francisco? And I said, Steve, like I'm a third year guy. You know, I don't have a lot of swag at San Francisco. And sure enough, Bill Walsh, uh, this unbelievable genius of a coach had seen something in Steve. He knew our offense at BYU. He was friends with Scoville. He knew a lot of, there was a lot of connections and behind the scenes with me knowing nothing about it, he had made, he was working this, that. made this deal to bring Steve. So Steve comes to the Niners and just like at BYU, he's behind Jim McMahon at the 49ers. He Joe was Montana. behind Joe Montana for three years. He went back into that mode of I'm going to get as good as I can. I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to get smarter. I'm going to learn everything I can from Joe. And so I saw it in two places. He did the same thing in both places. 
became a college Hall of Fame quarterback wow. as a backup for two years, and a NFL Hall of Fame quarterback being a backup for three years or more. And so patience, humility, yeah. drive, uh, Never vision. There's just so many great qualities about Steve that people think, oh, he just it just came so easy. No. Not at all. It was super, super hard for Steve to be able to accomplish the things he did. And I had a I had a armchair vision vision <laughs> of a lot of it. And so I, I love Steve. We're dear friends. And I just see how, how he's overcome so much. He's written great books that talk about this. So for people that may have mental health issues or issues with um, feelings and emotions of love, he's really put himself out he's there. He's become an expert there. Well, to be able because to, of all the difficulties yeah, that he's been transparent with his uh, yeah. experience, and it has helped. I don't know numbers, but so very many people. It's fascinating. That, you know, I think that that's something that he learned at BYU. I really do. I think that he was seasoned here, and I've seen so many more that have been. We and Tom, there are so many guys who I don't know. Um, even on our team, you know that that maybe came here because someone thought they'd change their life or something. I mean, BYU sometimes like missions attract people who are trying to make changes. So some of these guys came without necessarily the vision of BYU. And yet in our, in our uh, reunions, yeah. I see some of these guys who back then were leading interesting lifestyles. Interesting is a nice choice of well, words. No, you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. And now some of these guys have great leadership positions in the church or in their communities. And I think to to a person, they're all very complimentary of BYU and the experience they have here. Yeah, I think that it, BYU doesn't have the market on experience. No. I think college and being a student athlete in college is such a formidable time in a young person's life. I, I just get to see it every day. And I see the pain, the suffering, the joy, the elation, Every possible emotion, um, I've seen victories and defeat. Most every student athlete goes through the whole gamut of the whole spectrum of whether depression or and if you if you endure, you learn so much, and and that happens at every school. I, I you know I coach at Cal. Yeah, and I coached at Stanford, and I love those kids. My my student athletes, the, the DVs that I coached there, and at Cal, I was the head coach. Um, same thing, but here at BYU, you throw in another wrinkle into the equation. That's the spirit, and we promote that, and we talk about it, and we have prayers before practice and at meetings. And some people that come here, even members of the church, they're not used to that. When they come to BYU, it's another part of the equation where you're challenged. Are you going to be a disciple of Christ? Or are you just going to put it on the back burner now that you're not with under your mom and dad's tutelage or love? Right. And I, I think it's such a sweet thing to see student athletes and students at BYU that when they come here, they're challenged spiritually. And it's you a can journey. Go different, you can go different directions. And, and you know what about the journey is... You know, some people start young or, or early. Some people start midway through. But we're all on a journey, so it's important for us to be patient yeah. with those who are still, you know, absolutely walking that path. And I, I think, uh, you know, for being here, I've been, this is my 19th season as the athletic director. That's amazing. And I have this connection with a lot, so many of the student athletes that the key thing is stay on the covenant path. And if, if you're not a member of the church, what that would mean is you have— a spiritual pathway that will lead you to happiness and joy, the great plan of salvation. And as members of the church, we are trained and understand that. We study it. We feel it. Holy Ghost testifies of the truthfulness. Those people that are not members of our faith, Mike, I think in many cases they understand that better 
sometimes. And some of the members of the church. You're right. And so, like, one of the beautiful things that I love right now at BYU is we have a number of Muslim players that yeah. are the basketball team. Jake, our quarterback. They seem to fit a member right of the Jewish, Jewish faith community and strong. And, and they feel that at BYU, they're able to be who they are at their best. They're able to be their best self. And they are not, they don't have a cap or a, you know, a lid over their spiritual, emotional, or religious beliefs. They can express themselves. And I think it's something that a lot of people wouldn't know unless we share it. And I always tell, I, when, when people come here of different faiths, I always say, you would be foolish to come here and not try to continue to improve your spiritual strength with in your, your faith in your faith yeah with your maker and it it's i see that all the time and people think that you can't come here unless you're a member of the faith and that's not true you can grow more and i think you do now look the same thing's true there's wonderful churches at uh schools all over the country and if i i strongly encourage if you're a high school athlete and you're going to college Make your faith and your spiritual um, journey a huge part of your life because it is a huge part of your life. You know, Tom, one of the principles of Christianity that Jesus taught was going for after the one, taking care of the one. And the rest of us, if we're part of the 99 or if we're that one, see that love and that affection that our leader has for that individual who's in trouble or not on the path. And it gives us confidence that if we were on that path that in the same way, he would be coming for us too. And I wanted to share something. Maybe this is a little too sensitive, but my daughter, Sarah, ran track at BYU. And this was years ago now, you know, in the mid-2000s. And uh, one of her best friends, Chelsea Peterson, another track athlete, was in a tragic accident and lost her life. And Sarah, my daughter, you know, this one of her best friends died, was no longer with her. And Sarah was confused, as we all are, and especially with a tragic death. And she shared with me you know, without knowing I was going to talk to you, how joyful she felt when you were there, you know, comforting not only her, but the other friends and attending the the funeral and, and being with them. So Tom, I appreciate what you are doing with our institution and not just for our institution, for, for Christianity as a whole, because thank you for, for, for what, I mean, do you have any other stories that you'd like to share with us now that I've got a little too sensitive? No, well, I, I know I, I, it's, it's a nice memory to be able to think of the Peterson family. But Chelsea was a, a beautiful girl, an incredible athlete. She had just this incredible fire of passion I remember. burning inside of her. And her and family, just too. to be around was just a joy. And, you know, her life was cut short. She was too young to pass, but... Like you said, a lot of questions. At that time, the one thing that we can do is love. And it's a gospel of love. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of love. Um, The Savior said, as I have loved you, love one another. And so the answer is always love. And so I I knew her. It was early in my tenure, but I knew her enough that it, it caused grief and heartache for me as well. But I went to the funeral down in St. George, and I got to see um, mom and dad and meet them, and, and then she had a little sister and a little brother. And the little sister came up to me at the funeral and said, I want to cheer at BYU. And I thought, okay. And I just said <laughs> at the time, okay, I'll do everything I can. Are you good? <laughs> you know, I, I can't put you in there. I don't choose the cheer squad. But um, as things would have out, she was a great cheerleader in high school. And she came to BYU 
and she was a member of our cheer squad. So I got to be with um, Shaylee Peterson for her time here, and we're still very close, the Peterson family. Um, those are times when we all come together. And the, t- the track team it learned an incredible, sacred, valuable experience that they probably would never have wanted to learn. But it was just, it's timing in the Lord's hands. And so at those, when those things occur, we hope we're at our best. And sometimes we miss. And so my prayers are that we all are ready to serve when it's time. And that service is usually not hardcore work. It's usually love. It's usually putting an arm around someone or saying a kind word or, you know, maybe doing something special. And it's a, it's a, it's a BYU athletic family. And I really, you know, you can say that. The question is, do you act like a family? I think we felt that back when we were there, and I'm so excited that you're continuing that tradition. Yeah. I think that it's the spirit of this place. Um, one of the things that there's a, some great traditions, yeah, and it's important that we carry on the stories, and so I'm never too shy to tell a story about Lavelle Edwards or Jim McMahon or Mike Cronister or Danny Frazier yes. or Mike Lacey. The stories need to be told. Um, these young kids, they've forgotten who we were. <laughs> like, <let me laughs> for good you, reason. For they've good. forgotten our, ex, our exploits on the field, <laughs> and they've surpassed us in many ways. But so those traditions, I tell them, we're all part of one team. It's one team, BYU football. And if you're an alum, it doesn't matter if you were an Heisman Trophy winner like Ty Detmer, a Hall of Famer like Giff Nielsen, or a manager like Mel Farr. We all are one team. Still, if you were on it and you spilt blood and you <laughs> gave of your blood, sweat, and tears and you loved like Lavelle taught us, that lasts forever. It's simple. I know we're switching gears here, but I remember you and I, remember Gary Zoner. We would never forget Gary Zoner. Gary Zoner was an integral part of our teams back then. And when you look back at how we won some of the biggest games that we won, special teams had a big part of that. Right. So Gary Zoner was one of the first special team coaches where he was us. Usually they would work special teams through the as existing assistant coaches. Right. But Lavelle was one of the first coaches to bring in one person to run the whole special teams. And Gary was a creative genius, well, so, in my opinion. He came from University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. That's where he had was coaching. And I don't know how in the world Lavelle found him, but he did have an incredible impact on our team at that time and for future days. Remember our T-shirts? Oh, yeah. Top block. <laughs> Top rock. Top rock. Who's nuts? <laughs> I, I couldn't remember that one. I, I, but um, he had this fervor for special teams. He did. And one of the things that was great about it, and I love this, is back in those days, on the back of our helmets, we'd have these cougar decals. Yes. And if you were a special teams player, you'd get a bunch of them. If yes. If you made plays. Yes. And so there was some incentive and some great, inspiration to be able to go down not only make a play for your team but to get one of those stickers i I, i'm with you so anyway tom i i need you to be totally honest here but i remember you were on the end of the line and i was two in from you and we had a good kickoff team yeah we we usually pin those guys down behind the 20 yard line but i remember you and i kind of Making eye contact like, I'm going to beat you this time. Do you remember yeah, that? I mean, I don't think a lot of people would understand, like, in the course of a game, a real game, you're going to, there's some gamesmanship. And sure. There's some competition within the team. And it's all in good faith. And oh, yeah. Good no, this was fun. And it was fun. and Because and you was were like, fast. Who's first? Who's going to get to the ball first? But I think one of the things that Gary made it such a great um, special teams is, Sometimes coaches de-emphasize special teams and they put like lower level players. But I mean, I played on special teams my senior year. Yeah, I was on. So did I. I was on kickoff team, and I was on the um, punt team, 
when I was and I was on punt return when you were a starting. When I was a defensive starting back. defensive back. I never in my four years that I played, I never came off of special teams, and I wanted to be on special teams. That's awesome. And so I think that that was a tradition that you know when you were starting, you were on the special teams. That's how it goes. And it wasn't like you didn't have players that go, do you know who I am? I'm a starting <laughs> I, I'm not, guard. I'm not going to be on the field goal team. I don't do that. Tom, when I when I made that catch against Texas A&M, I was so wiped out, tired, and e- excited that I was almost late to get out to the kickoff team. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's a good story. So I learned something today, Mike. That I could see how that would happen, though. Lavelle Edwards. We both have this sincere and and huge appreciation for him. But my first impression as a high school athlete coming here to BYU was, you know, and your high school coach generally runs the whole show. Was that your case in Lecter Session? Yeah, for sure. I mean, more or less. And Coach Edwards kind of didn't. Right. You know, so my first question was, what does this guy do? By the end of my career... Lavelle Edwards and his leadership style, I felt, should be plastered up on on business leadership books. On, and so, I mean, do you have anything to say about his leadership style? I, I, don't, I think you said hit the nail on the head, and that is, he was a great leader. I, you know, I don't really remember him calling the special call off the play sheet. No, he didn't hold a play sheet, but he trusted his coaches, which was super important, and he had this discernment to hire great coaches so for a long period of time his coaches were great um one of one of our dear coaches uh, tom ramage who coached our defensive line passed away he a couple me months in ago oh yeah um, and, and you know i remember just prior to him dying probably a couple months before i was able to sit down with tom and had this un- unbelievable um just talk and memory of how it was. And so we talked about Lavelle. We talked about some of the players and some of the coaches. We laughed. We cried. Lavelle was just so unique in that he was meek. He was meek. He he was strong in his personality, Mm -hmm. and he was strong in his conviction, but he was smooth and he was compassionate. And he understood players far more than most coaches did. He was a, a savant at relationships. He knew when we were struggling. I almost share a little story. So my freshman year, I redshirted. So I wasn't playing. I can remember going and sitting in the stands for the first year, watching the games from the stands and thinking, what in the world am I doing? And 78 was an interesting year to watch. Well, it, I, I, I just know that. And, like, it was it was hard. I was a little bit homesick. I loved the team. I kind of saw my future. But it was, like, now November, and it was getting cold, and I was out there going, what am I doing? Am I ever going to play here? And, I, you know, the coaches, once the season starts and you're redshirting, they you. they've forgotten about you. And my dad and my mom came up for Thanksgiving to be with me. It was my first year away from home, and I couldn't go home. So they came up. And uh, I remember this on this field. I'm pointing out the window to this to the plot. And field. when I walk out there, even though it's not the exact spot because it's on this ground, my dad wanted to see Lavelle. And he wanted to talk to, my, he wanted to, talk to Lavelle about how I was doing. And he wasn't a dad that was going to complain, and he just wanted to kind of see what Lavelle's impressions of, of my play was and how I was acting. So I go out there, and we're stretching out, and Lavelle and my dad, I look back, and they're talking. And I'm like, oh, boy, oh, no. here we go. Oh, no. And then the horn blows, and we start practicing. It's like 45 minutes into practice, and Lavelle, the head coach, is still over by the entryway to the gate talking to my dad. And I'm thinking, I'm in big trouble now. He's taken a Lavelle away from practice, from half of practice. And um, then I Lavelle leaves, and my dad kind of goes over to watch practice. When practice is over, I sprint over to my dad to say, Dad, what were you doing? You can't talk to the head coach for that long. <laughs> he says, oh, we were talking about you. And 
he had a lot of things to say about you. And he said, if you have any inclination that you think you're going to leave, you're not. You're staying. Lavelle Edwards is a great man and a great coach. I believe in him. And there's no way I'll let you come home. I think because of he, I, he had not an ounce of envy in him. And so he attracted the best coaches in the, in the country. And, and I wanted to contrast because Norm Chow became an, an unbelievably great offensive coordinator. And then he went on to other schools. And I just remember one incident where Norm Chow is running our old BYU offense successfully. And he's getting all the, everybody's lauding him. In fact, more than the head coach even. Yeah. And I saw body language just on TV. That head coach was jealous. Yeah. And Norm Chow wasn't the offensive coordinator at that school the next year. Mm. And that never would have happened with no. Lavelle Edwards. One other great story that I can tell about Lavelle, and this is great. So one of my dear friends, who's my deputy athletic director, Brian Santiago, one of his sons, um, Colson Santiago, when he was younger, was they lived in Lavelle's ward. So Colson knew Lavelle Edwards. He knew him. He was a retired coach and an older gentleman. He knew Patty, but he knew him well. But he was a young kid. He was like 10, I think. And one day, Brian and Colson were driving by the stadium. And Colson looks up at the stadium and says, Dad, you know what's really cool? Lavelle's named after the stadium. <laughs> and Brian, Bryce, Brian did quite understand that. He got named after the stadium. And I, I love to tell that story because there's so many times, Mike, where I'm either in that stadium or driving by, or just looking over that I see Lavelle Edwards Stadium and think, how were we so blessed, so lucky to have Lavelle as our coach? Unbelievable. And uh, it was a it was an era that should never be forgotten. It should always be remembered. And for the reasons that we're talking about today, those are things that should live on. And it's different. Things have changed. We've had some great quarter, uh, uh, coaches since I since I've been the AD. Bronco Mendenhall, Kalani Sataki, they carry on that tradition. I'm super proud of them that they, both of them, were in connection with Lavelle while they were coaching, and they learned things from him, and they wanted to not be Lavelle, but they wanted to embody some of the great ideals that he taught. And I think that every coach on this campus, not just football, should um, have an understanding of who he was, what he represented, and how he loved. And if they do, they'd be much better. Amen, brother. Tom. Let's go. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. you tremendously. This is Beyond the Game. Mr. Tom Holmo, thank you for your time, your effort, your energy, all that you've done and all that you're doing. And uh, thank you. This basketball team is pretty fun. We know, let's not talk about another it. Another story, another day. Yeah, another, if, if you will, <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.